sanctuary. That was my yeah. It was the very first time they ever tried that. Well, as you can see, we've uh, we've already started huh? talking before the, the, are we on the, air? the podcast really gets started here. Uh, so what the hell is he talking? Welcome about? everybody to the. Uh, Lucky 13, lucky number 13 uh, for our video podcast. We and also wore hockey masks. Almost in time for Halloween as yeah. well. Oh, almost we should have. For Halloween. Yeah. So, but we'll have, a, uh, we'll have time for We'll a, do a Halloween, we'll have a Halloween next episode. Time. Next time. We'll have a Halloween time. episode coming up where uh, we'll figure out what we're going to discuss. Uh, I'm Tony Armour, Executive Director of the Sunscreen Film Festival. Uh, today we have a superhero, uh, which if you haven't seen him by now, superhero. Uh, superhero. Brad Siberson, writer. Tyler Martin Olich, Programming Director for the Sunscreen Film Festival. Uh, let's see if we got any festival news to discuss right away here. We actually have a very, very, very big announcement that I cannot tell you yet. But as soon so as it's it, not really an announcement, it's more of a secret. A secret. There, 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 there will be an announcement. Who's NDA lift is next week, right? Uh, I don't so know. I what you said it was like the 20th. Well, there's something else for the... Uh, uh, so you, but you can tell. Like, I can tell you guys uh, afterwards. Okay. Tyler already knows Maybe what the secret is. We just uh, we can't announce it officially yet until they, who they are, tell us we can announce they, it. But it's uh, they, but it's a big deal. It's, so it, it'll be very good. One percent. Um, so it, but uh, send your films to the film festival right now because we're uh, accepting call for entries uh, for a wide variety of categories. Everything, including the Boy in the Bubble category. Boy. Shorts to features, yeah. Boy in the Bubble um, fan films. I can't remember how many we had at this point. We're still under the uh, the early bird. Doesn't expire till the end of this month. Yeah. Um, so if you. Send your movie in in the next, I think, week and a half. You can get, it's almost 15% off what oh, our normal wow. That's uh, good. submission rate is. But I don't, we have definitely more now than we had last year at this time, as far as submissions go. I can't remember two years ago, but we're... Yeah, we're on pace. We're on pace for, yeah, uh, for a, lot more, really well. a lot more films. So, uh, yeah, so send us, uh, send us your movies. Send us your screenplays. We'll have the uh, literary managers from Los Angeles that are basically the judges for the screenplay competition at the film festival this year. So... You know, great opportunity to uh, meet some people in the business with the power to make some things happen. So I guess we'll uh, we'll get started here. Um, we were just chatting about random film stuff like usual. Again, if you uh, haven't joined us before, that's sort of what we do. Um, yeah, realistically, when the camera's off, it's exactly the same. <laughs> except sometimes some of us are just in our boxers. That's the only. And when, when the turn when the camera turns off, we we do end up talking for probably another hour after the whole thing is uh, after the whole thing's over with. But. So, you know, we're just kind of, we're kind of letting you in on our private lives here. So, uh, one of the things Sad, I wanted to, it? yeah, and not that anybody <laughs> cares about our private lives, but one of the things I wanted to chat about today is I went and saw uh, Argo the oh, other day. Josh has, uh, has anybody seen uh, seen the trailer for Argo? I'm sure. Uh, Everyone's seen the trailer for most, Argo. Most, pe most people have. Museum. Do you want me to see if I can invite him to the festival? Well, that would be really cool. Okay. okay. Joshua Berman, who wrote I think someone should Argo. film yeah. the you script, actually. That would actually be really cool. That one of the best articles about real superhero community ever done. Yeah, in Rolling Stone magazine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, right. so we're gonna, I'm going to roll the, the trailer for Argo here in the background. Uh, Which, if, uh, right now, you've probably seen a million times, but in the future, people In the not. future. So, yeah. if you haven't seen this, it's obviously about the uh, Iran hostage crisis in 1979 and six Americans that managed to escape the embassy that were then being, uh, you know, Safely, uh, safely kept at the Canadian ambassador's house while all this was all while all this was going on, and then this is a now declassified um, CIA file about how they got them out of there, which was that they actually made up a fake movie, and a CIA agent flew into Iran and put this whole thing together where they actually pretended to look at location sites and things like that, and snuck them out of Iran. And it's and I went and saw it the other day, and it was really, really good. You ben really Affleck's really grown as an actor. Oh yeah, yeah. Not only, you know, not only is he a good is, actor, I but I never understood the, the there was the big Ben Affleck hate for a while. Yeah, he's always a you know a decent actor at worst. It, he said it best. A good one at best. He said it best. What nearly killed his career was Benifer. Yeah, it was being Benifer nearly killed his career, and yep. he says, and he he didn't expect that. It got completely out of control, and he didn't work for a while. I saw him in an interview. He didn't work for a while, and so because of Benifer. Yeah, because yeah, because of who he was dating when he was dating, yeah. you know, J Lo, which is a well, weird it thing. It wasn't because of her. It wasn't her fault either. It, it was the. It was the thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the thing, Benifer. Because oh, I'm here to talk about my movie. Let's talk about Benifer. No, I want right. to talk about my movie. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that's what. When did Geely come out? Because that was what sort of that was the last movie that someone took a chance on him, and there was a good spell in between. Yeah, yeah he had a good five years where he really yeah. didn't do. Because he was in too like uh, some of all fears, and I mean, he was in some big. Well, I'm actually glad. Flopped. I'm actually glad to see him like producing he, and doing stuff because I like him. Didn't kill him the way that Benifer did. Yeah. And it, yeah. 
alcohol yeah. is and, just underrated. And, and he did a uh, he did not just a good job acting in this, but he directed the film. Oh, he, he plays a role as, as, as well. Oh yeah, he's the guy with the beard. Yeah, he's he oh, play, okay, he plays the uh, with the lead character, the okay. CIA agent, who in real life's name is Tony Mendez. Who at the end of the film, you know, when they kind of run, where are they now, sort of thing, you know, they let you know. Well, that, so you know how about don't ruin the end of the film for them. Well, it's, it's yeah. I anyway, know no, I mean, I won't tell the end of the film. This is you know after the film is over, the, who the real life people are, and yeah. anyways, it's a big big deal. This guy in the CIA basically and, and yeah. doing this. So I know one of the guys in the actual story that was involved in it was uh, one of the guys that set up the Sante raid in uh, Vietnam. Uh, I'm not familiar yeah. with the Sante raid. Yeah, one of the guys, and I want to say Colonel Beckwith from. Uh, from Delta Force. Oh, really? Was also involved in the guy that That's made similar films. No, Delta no. Force was yeah. involved at some level. I like that Mega Force sure. words, not deeds. Yeah, but but over but overall, it was actually it was a it was a really no, good movie. It was, one of the, it was one of those films that at the at the very beginning so of the movie. The this is this isn't giving anything away. But at the very beginning of the movie, when you when you see you know the Iranian Revolution, when you see the Iranians breaking into the American Embassy, man, we, I'm just pissed off because I, I remember being a kid. In 1979, when all this happened, and there was this, there was an Iranian kid who went to my grade school that got the holy hell beat out of him every single day because of this. So I feel bad for the kid and his family but at the time. Like I don't, I don't think people realize even more so than Afghanistan, Iraq. People were really, Incensed. really angry. More angry. More. They were, I think they were more angry in 1979 at what was going on than I've seen. And the problem is that with the Iran, I came here to escape fundamentalism yeah and still getting the snot pounded out of him even though he came here to get away from all yeah that. and 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 they do such a good job at the beginning of the film with you're watching it and I was I was literally flat-out angry I was you know like oh mother you just you well, I think when you kill someone there's at least a resolution there right but when you you kidnap someone you feel totally powerless and helpless if you're in back time that's why Reagan ended why are we going oh, to yeah. be political here but it was because you know we couldn't do anything yeah we were impotent yeah, you, yeah, you can do because they had you know hostages. Guys, and, I knew that were uh, in the Navy before me. I was in the Navy in the late eighties, but the chiefs and stuff would tell us they had their fingers over the button. Yeah, like this, and the Iranians made a deal that okay, let us keep them as long as Carter's in office, and the second he gets out, we'll yeah, there was a there was a little Reagan was the hell with missions, and this we're going to invade. Yeah, well, and the thing and, that, and, yeah. that was the thing nobody was scared of Carter. Yeah, Reagan right. got in office, and they were terrified of Reagan. Well, they they, because they made a backroom deal right there, where they're yeah. like, "Look, we're we're going to save a little face here, and when this guy takes office, we're going to." Well, and and when you see the film, there is some of that you know Politico stuff that goes on. In the film, on when they decide to do this, do this mission, and you know, there are other things that happen surrounding this mission that I won't give anything away. That you can see sort of the the backside political dealings about how, you know, choices that they're going to make for these hostages or not make for these hostages, just based on how it's going to look, sort of thing. Oh, so it was it was it's it was really good. So not only do you have you know, the whole, you know, they're getting kidnapped and then trying to sneak them out and then, you know, going out to, you know, John Goodman is, of course, phenomenal. Alan, Alan Arkin, John Goodman is, Alan awesome. Arkin is great. Alan Arkin is, Alan is, Arkin's good is hilarious. Too. It's really funny. And there's this one line they just repeat throughout the whole film that I won't give it away, but it's just really funny. Um, he plays a film producer, right? He plays a film producer who's like an old school guy. been producing films forever. And he's just witty and funny. And he's, got, he's, got, he's funny in the quick boom in the trailer. You can just sense yeah, the character yeah. coming he, out he, of he does good. He does a great job. And then... You know the way that Affleck actually paces the film and keeps it going, and 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 you know, I mean, this is a historical event, so you know what happens at the end of the film, but you're still like, oh, That's you know, and, and so you know, great editing, great just storytelling yeah, like, like to I move said, that story the, along uh, and keep that tension there. It's like really I said before, good. the camera came on. This this feels like one of those movies that everyone's gonna love, and it's gonna sweep the Oscars. It's just that movie. Yeah, it was it was it's, good. It's one of those movies like Jaws. That's good but instead of going there and saying i guess this is good i've been told this is good you enjoy it and you you get it and you know why it's good and you, you know what i you know what i really liked at the beginning of the film and again this doesn't give anything away either you know when they do the warner brothers logo comes up at the beginning of the film they use the old logo from 1979 oh, to, uh, cool. to come up as the as the warner brothers that's, logo now we just need film, someone so. to actually film the movie that the whole thing is right <laughs> Yeah, no, that would be funny because there. Are, they, I mean, you see that there's there is an actual script, oh, of course, storyboards, you know, Maybe all that sort of now. stuff. Maybe you never someone know. Might. They, they someone might you know come Things, out. And, I wonder if the uh, CIA bothered to copyright it. You know. Yeah, you know if the CIA. Who knows? But, I doubt they did. You're right. You know, I. It's. You uh, never know though, because that's a searchable record. The yeah. other open like that. That's that's cool like that where they they changed the the logo mm -hmm. of the film company. It just it just popped in my head. At the beginning of Waterworld, 
where the earth is turning, mm -hmm. the universal thing, you see all the land yeah. mass. Oh, really? Yeah, there. that was actually... That's cool. I remember and, watching yeah. that thinking, this is cool, and then I watched the rest of Waterworld. Like, <laughs> like, I didn't like Waterworld. <laughs> Loved it. See, now, Waterworld was one of those films that generally was widely panned as being... It's not anywhere you know, near as bad as people say. No, it's not. But I don't think it's good. I the don't like it. The Trimoran is like the Batmobile of the water. Yeah. I mean, that thing... I mean, a collector in France has it now. It, it, all that stuff worked. All the... Everything on it worked. You stomp the... Uh, you know, the pedals to make all the sails come up and everything like that. All that worked. Did you find the actual opening? Yeah, this is... Well, this is the trailer for... Oh, I was going to uh, say. Never mind for, the trailer. You should for, find the opening for Waterworld. Even... Superheroes talking about because it's freaking awesome. Yeah. yeah, you see Florida just kind of go. Ooh. Well, maybe they'll maybe they will do it I here had at the beginning. I had a very liberal is... friend who claimed that was going to happen to Florida because of global warming by 2006. And when he's like, "You're moving down so there." Here's the here's the globe at the beginning oh, or the idiots. trailer. So, but I'm regardless, the other day. Kevin Costner because he posted Waterworld. a new thing that said it's going to happen in 2013. Like, hello, idiot. What happened in 2006? That's what I asked him. He had no answer for that. And have these guys ever noticed that when ice melts in a glass, the water level goes down, not up? Just don't ruin their fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what you know, for those people who may or may not remember, Kevin Costner was a was actually a really big, big actor. Because before this, before in the Postman, Waterworld. he made good movies. Yeah, he yeah. well, I, I, popular I movies. Like the Postman, actually. I never saw the Postman. I'm just assuming it's bad because that's what I heard in the internet from from some crank. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I get all my information from. That and small children. Well, he, you know, he had he had a run of, um, you know, he was like a he was like a, a leading man, very, you know, very leading yeah. man, you know, did no, no but but out. he was in um, he did No Way yeah, Out and, and uh, Dances with Wolves, Dances No Way Out, Wolves. You know, he plays the same character in every fucking right. movie. And my friend Todd hates him. And then Robin Hood, Robin Hood was uh, I enjoyed Robin Hood. I, I really the liked 90, the, Robin, the 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 91 Robin Hood. Okay, it, it was fun. And I that was probably at the time as my cynicism was kicking in. Here's why. Trivia for you: The float plane that just got shot mm -hmm. down. The pilot was Jack Black. Really? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very young Jack Black. Mm -hmm. Oh, speaking of Jack Black, uh -oh. this is cool. I uh, I was listening to an interview with Jack Black uh, the other day with Elvis Mitchell uh, on the treatment. So a little shout out to uh, KCRW in Santa Monica, Elvis Mitchell on the treatment. Um, Jack Black was doing an interview talking about the film Bernie that he's in, and. Uh, Jack Black was uh, talking about, I can't remember the guy's name now, but the comic who does Triumph the Insult Comic Dog. Yeah, yeah I guess. I love that guy. Wrote a Green Lantern script. And apparently it was hilarious. And oh, you know, awesome. I've actually heard about that. And it was supposed to be really, really Wasn't funny. It written kind of for Jack Black. And Jack, Bla and Jack Black was going to play Green Lantern. Yeah, I remember. What's wrong? I would have liked that a lot more. Oh, and that's what they were. That's what they were saying. They were like, I read that. this, I this that movie would have been yes. awesome and funny. And Jack Black playing Green Lantern because anybody can be Green Lantern because you get the ring and you just have right. to make up whatever. And so, uh, DC Warner Brothers didn't yes. like didn't like their version of it and decided to go with. You know the other one, and so Jack Black, of course, was joking around, and he's like, "Well, now, now that they've made that one and it was terrible, maybe they'll make my version of Green Lantern. They well, the made two is, Hulks. You nothing's know, going to stop them from making one that's a quote unquote a parody." Right. Thinking. What always gets me about people too, like when you're talking about superhero movies and shows, that they're, "Well, I like this version better because it was more realistic," <laughs> and you look at them and you say, "You realize you're talking about a comic book." And they look at you kind of sideways like this, like... No, because you've just blown their mind. No one's ever said that to her before. about a comic book and the, the realism. It's a, you're talking about a comic book. And this comes, and he, from, it comes from a man in uh, red and blue underwear. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not supposed to be real. Well, we've got our own problems with that in the superhero community. Right. But... You know, it's a comic book. Yes. And they're worried about it being realistic. You know, I, I never got that. I never got that. Yeah, but I would have I would have loved. I would much rather. I would love that. to have seen Jack Black yeah, and Green Lantern. That's why I'll watch. Yes. I'll watch a uh, Superman three over a lot of other superhero movies any day. Yeah, just be, because yeah. it it just lets itself be. Daffy what it is. Duck became the Green Lantern accidentally one time. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, was pretty fun. damn funny. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. That's good stuff. It wasn't in the Duck Dodgers show, if I remember correctly. I cannot, I cannot remember. remember. I cannot remember. I remember, but it, I remember seeing that he fought Sinestro and everything. Yeah, it was pretty good. You know what I actually saw the other day? I did not even know existed because um, I actually watched that the other day on uh, YouTube. Uh, there's a Hager the Horrible cartoon. Who knew that? No way. There's only one. I think I. It came out in the '80s, like when we were yeah, in high school. I vaguely remember that. But um, it I'm was legitimately 
funny. I mean, I like, and everybody, you, these guys know me, I'll like sit there and I'll be like, that was hilarious. But this made me smile. It was funny. I mean, huh, I'm going to watch that. Definitely worth seeing. Well, and, and all the people who are doing the voices are famous sitcom actors, too. Oh. Talking about uh, Jack Black and um, you know how the studio didn't like it, uh, there was an article in The Hollywood Reporter where they interviewed a bunch of showrunners, and they asked them for some of their most absurd uh, comments, notes that they've gotten from executives. Um, one of the uh, one of the one of the notes that they got was uh, from an executive about whatever they were writing. Said, "I don't know. Seems kind of gay." Uh, <laughs> uh, um, Bro Brokeback Mountain, or maybe <laughs> Masters of the Universe. Most most absurd note ever gotten, and this is for uh, Craig Thomas, uh, one of the uh, showrunners for Ooh, How I Met Your Mother. One. For a comedy screenplay, a features agent said we shouldn't set a part of the story in Mexico, but instead in Cuba, because Cuba is hot right now after the Elian Gonzalez controversy in 2000. That's just an odd thing to say. <laughs> Um, uh, this is for the guys uh, that do the uh, one of the guys, David Caspe, for the uh, Happy Endings TV show on um, ABC. Uh, for feature, I won't name. Is there any way there could be more kicks in the balls? I had a pitch with the working title American Feud. It was a modern day take on the Hatfields McCoys, hundred year long feud. The executive said, "Okay, but where's the conflict?" <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's some really I won't, oh I won't go through all of these, but there are some really uh, well, some pimp really the article funny. I'll let me, yeah, I'll, um, we'll find something. I, any any notes that you guys? Are, Tyler's done some stuff over the years with some executives. Uh, any notes that you've gotten from uh, from people that have just been like uh, absurd on uh, on projects? Uh, I was doing a feature film where I won't say who we were working with, but it was a major studio, and the whole movie was supposed to be about racism. It's taking place in the South. And uh, the one note we got back in the script day one was like, can you do this without the black people? Ooh. I swear <laughs> to God. I swear to God. <laughs> You're right there. <laughs> well, that's like, no, there are no black people in the South, and just like... Um... <laughs> <laughs> That, that is, is the best one I've ever that, read. That, that, I that, swear to that, God, that, that's good. That was, entire, that was the entire crux of the film. And they, they, they was like, Hi. Racism in the South. Can you do it without the black people? Oh, people? my God. Um, uh, my favorite one I ever heard of, with, and I hope Harlan Ellison doesn't sue us for this, but he swears that he worked on um, an early draft of the script for um, Star Trek, the motion picture. Yeah. I believe it. Oh, and, um, no, I don't, because him and Gene Roddenberry got into a fist fight. <laughs> I can see that with Ellison. But um, the real story is much more boring. But um, the story that went around Hollywood for a while was... Um, they were everyone's pitching ideas, pitching ideas. You know, we want this. He's like, no, it's the movie. It's got to be big. They've already like encountered, you know, like the Greek gods and this robot that could destroy the universe. All this stuff in the TV show. We need something big. And Harlan Ellison is just sitting there, not saying anything, not saying anything. And finally, he's like, I got an idea. How about there's a warp drive malfunction, and the Enterprise is propelled just farther than, than any Federation ship has ever gone at the ends of the universe. And when they get there, suddenly there's just a big wall, like a big black thing that no one can get through. So it's Kirk. So he's like, we're going to shoot our way through it. <laughs> so we blow a hole in it. When they blow a hole in it, th there's this huge eye, and they realize they're looking on the face of God himself. And he looks at the uh, production guy, because he's Harlan Ellison. He looks at the uh, producer like he thinks he's going to be worshipped. And the guy looks at him and says, damn it, no, I said think big. <laughs> at, which, at which point, Ellison pissed oh a huge fit and laughed. You know, they did kind of steal his idea for Voyager, though. Yeah, mm -hmm. but and actually though, the, other, the Delta Quadrant. But apparently, Stephen King is friends with Ellison and talked to him and asked him if that story was true. And Ellison's like, "It's a great story. I don't want to say it's not true, but it's not." What really happened was, um, we were in there pitching ideas, and, and um, the guy who was in charge was like, "Well, I, you know, I like the idea of them going back in time to the time of dinosaurs, and it's going to be almost like uh, the one where they fought the Borg and they went back in time and tried to change the past." Right. That was going to be the plot of the first one, and. Um, the guy was like, well, I was reading a book where Aztecs, you know, supposedly, you know, were from space and invented mm -hmm. the television and stuff. Can we work Aztecs into it? And Ellison's like, there weren't any Aztecs at, you know, the time of the dinosaurs. And he's like, yeah, but it's science fiction. Well, who's going to know? <laughs> <laughs> and, Ellison no, was just, and Ellison was just like, you're an idiot. Just walked out. Nobody cares that <laughs> Kel Welch was fighting them as long as well, she had the loincloth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's funny you said the showrunners. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the showrunners there. Uh, one of the networks... One of the places I've worked, uh, I just finished reading a book called The Showrunners, mm -hmm. and one of the guys in it was Jeff Sagansky. He was talking about when he was it with CBS, and he came up with this pilot for a show called Knights of the Kitchen Table, and CBS refused to air it because it had a lesbian in it and all this stuff. Is that based on the comic strip? 
No idea. Okay. So anyway, uh, he called about a problem because he was then working for the network that I worked at, mm -hmm. and he was pissed. And he calls, he says, this is Jeff Sagansky. Oh, my God. And I said, oh, Mr. Sagansky, I just wrote a book with you in it. He's like, really? Go ahead. And we talk, and he, he forgot all about the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and we sat and we took, says, it was a nice meeting you. I'll, I'll talk to you later, son. It's like, you too, sir. Have a good evening. He's probably hung up the phone. he forgot all about it. <laughs> I, bet, I bet he hung up the phone. He went and got a cup of coffee. He's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, how did that happen? Great guy, though. That's awesome. Great guy. That's awesome. Uh, well, there's a uh, comic strip about... Um, Basically, a bunch of people role play, playing Dungeons and Dragons or something around the, the table. I called Knights of the Kitchen Table. I assume it's probably a TV show based on that, which would be funny. Yeah, we, and we'll, we can segue into Dungeons and Dragons. I'm in here, but I want to give you uh, one one last um, other uh, on note here. Uh, Friends co-creator Marta Kaufman uh, pitched a show about a hotel in outer space, and the note said, "Does it have to be in outer space?" Uh, I did a, a pilot about a girls' boarding school called BS. The network bought the pitch, saw multiple drafts of the script. Watched several cuts of the pilot, approved the credits, and the night we were locking it, they called to say, BS, you can't show a, call a show BS. So, just, uh... uh what I don't, was the name of the mother in uh, Malcolm in the Middle? Is it... It's not Jane... Is it Jane Kaz... Oh, oh, uh, I almost know this. Um, she was Jane in... Uh, she was no. in Martin Lawrence show, too. She no, no, the, she's in um, Sons of Anarchy. Oh, no, Malcolm in the Middle. Uh, not, I was thinking no, of the no, no, show. No, oh, no, 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 I was thinking... The mom in Malcolm in the Middle. That's what yeah, I'm trying I was to thinking of the wrong show. Did I say the wrong show? No, I didn't. Okay, Malcolm... It's, is it Jane I was. Th I was thinking... You're the, thinking the girl from Married with Children. From Married with Children. Yeah. No, no. And, and I was Kate thinking, for, Kate Seagal, for some bizarre yeah, reason, yeah. I was thinking um, everyone hates... Uh, Equally attractive what's his woman. The, man, Chris, the mom Chris. from Malcolm in the middle. I want to say her name is Jane Casimir, but she claims to be... I think that be, sounds close. She claims to be the queen of unaired pilots. She worked... She used, you used to see her as, as Kate Jackson's friend in Scarecrow and Mrs. King, and she had the Never big hair and everything. Then you didn't see her for a long time, but she said she worked constantly. And nothing got made. Right, but she always played a mom. In a TV pilot, every you know, every single week, she'd always play a mom. I think she TV was pilot. in that that horrible zombie. Movie she might pilot have been. That just came out that no one saw. The one I, I yeah, the one you sent me. I watched. Now um, the dad from Malcolm in the Middle. Boy, did he go on to other things. Oh, Brian Cranston. Oh yeah, he's in Argo. Yeah, he's in Argo, and he yeah. just won. He's Emmy after Emmy after Emmy, uh, and three Emmys. That's hard now to for, uh, Yeah, he's hot. Dad. I like talk yeah. about uh, underrated pilots. I liked um. Bruce Campbell, who's in um, Burn Notice now, told, or not told me, like we were hanging out, <laughs> cool. told someone that um, in an interview that uh, he got on that show because he was just hanging around the house, you know, doing whatever he does. And um, he got a f phone call from his agent. The guy's like, yeah, we got an um, hour-long uh, pilot we'd like you to do. And he, he, he's like, I literally sighed and said, doctor, cop, or lawyer. And they said, none of the above. And I was like, huh. No, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one last, one last note, then I'll move on from this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Oliver Goldstick on uh, Pretty Little Liars on ABC Family. Uh, I was working on a project about the Pilgrims and the Mayflower for NBC at Outline Stage. I was asked why the Pilgrims were in their 30s. I said, well, that was, that was their ages. And uh, the note was, well, they can't be. These people have to look hot when they're wet because they're on the Mayflower. You know, they have to be younger and hotter. I hate television. <laughs> so, uh, moving, moving on before we make uh, well, Superhero 2 angry about the ridiculous on, notes. I, should we talk about about what I had to do this week. Yes, let's do this. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I let's, think that let's, would be let's awesome. Hear, let's hear the story. Old superhero. Oh, give me time to grab a beer. Yeah. Old superhero had to go to sensitivity training. Now, is this everybody or just you? Well, uh, you would think just me. Because, <laughs> you know, or at least put me at the head of the class. Is it because you're the problem with the fins? Is that the... With everything. Okay. But you think they'd, they'd put me and say, see him, don't be him. Right. And that'd be the class and that'd be the end of it. But so this is your whole whole group, group. Whole, and they had like five different groups, and they had a guy come all the way from New York to teach sensitivity training. I took offense to this <laughs> because I think it's political correctness run amok, and I'm a man. I'm required. I'm not required to be sensitive. <laughs> I'm required to uh, lift weights and eat meat, <laughs> and that's about it. So. I went and got the sensitivity hat <laughs> and wore it to sensitivity training. And I walk in and the guy looks at me and he says, I love your hat. And I said, well, I'm sensitive now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a sensitivity hat on. I look like a gay Sinatra. How can I not be sensitive? And so I'm like this sitting in class and even the vice president came in and she looks, she's like, I love your hat. And I'm like, 
I, I must ask, where did you get the hat? The hat came from Party, Party City, City, right okay. next door. To that makes sense. Yeah, it was great, it very convenient. But anyway, there's this one guy in the class, and the teacher wanted it to roll along. It turned out to be great. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Did you get I, to role play and act oh, a little? Yeah, I participated in everything. <laughs> it was fun. I was like the Demi Moore movie where she harassed Michael Douglas and stuff like that. They show but, clips? Huh? Do I they? wish. I like Demi Moore. But uh, does it? anyway, there's this one guy in the class who wouldn't let the class roll along. He would not let the class roll along. Like the teacher would say, well, this is harassment if the sky is blue. And he'd be like, well, what if the sky is green? I think, I, every, I think Eskimos are smug. Yeah, yeah. And everyone that is guy. just looking at like this going, for Christ's sake, man, would you let the class move on? Because the whole thing was based on intent and impact. Right. And this guy just couldn't get it. And you were there with me when I saw this. I remember we were on a plane and we saw it together. What did we see? Uh... All of a sudden, because the intent and impact, and this guy just couldn't get it. And I said, I just said, do you remember Star Trek II? <laughs> and everyone in place, look at me. <laughs> and I say, Star Trek II, I saw an interview with Ricardo Montalban. And Ricardo Montalban said he was trying to play Khan again. And it kept coming out as Mr. Rourke. And the teacher even of the class now, I've got his attention. Right. He's like this, looking at me. And he's going like this. Wait, and I said, Where is she going with this? Yeah. And Ricardo Montalban couldn't play Khan again because it kept coming out as Mr. Rourke. Like he'd get on the monitor and go, smiles, smiles, everyone. It, it, it kept coming out. And he could not get back into Khan. Good job. It couldn't save him. And then one morning he woke up, and I said it just like this too. I said, he woke up and he said, no one says, today I will be evil. And... He realized then that he was trying to play Khan evil, and Khan wasn't evil. His intent, and I'm pointing to the intent right. on the grease board, his intent to him was just fine. He was like, you son of a bitch, you killed my wife, you son of a bitch, you destroyed my plant, you left me here, I'm going to kick your ass. His intent was just fine. The impact of it was evil right. to everyone else, but not to him. Which proves um, what a, I mean. What a great character that is, and right. how he played it was so great. Because again, no one wakes up and is like, I'm the, no one thinks they're the bad Today guy. Today I will be evil. In, yeah. in his version of this movie, he's the hero. Yeah. Right, and it's a and, tragic ending. And then this dumbass finally shut up, <laughs> so we could get on with things. But it was an interview that you and me saw. Yeah, we were yeah. watching a DVD on our way back from the Sunset Strip. Yeah, and that's where I and I that always stuck with me. Yeah, and that's you know how I, you write a good villain, and that's well, and that's that's in their head, they're the good guy. That's what makes a good actor. That's that's an actor's responsibility to, to, whatever their intent. What what is what is their objective? What is that character's objective? And, and it's not what what, is, what what are they? What do they have to do to get to their objective? What if they do? What do they do if something stop? What do they do if they do or they don't achieve their objective? Those are all things okay. that as an a villain actor you need to, to think. You need to think of though, as a, when you're cast as a villain, you need to think of almost as if you're the hero. Right. But, like, what does the hero want to do? What does the hero need to do? But of all the things to be brought up in sensitivity training, <laughs> Star Trek Two, and it got the ball rolling again. You know what though? It's better than if you brought up, say, Star Trek Seven. Well, that's true too. Well, that, yeah. But. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I just couldn't believe But anyway, so sensitivity training turned out to be fun, and we got to talk about Star Trek too. So give so. us some tips from sensitivity training. Yeah, is there, is there anything you can tell Should us? Should I not use the word clit well, in day that's basically just it. You're in, you just got to remember that your intent may be different than your impact. That's all you have to remember, you know, and, and that's basically what sensitivity training came down to, to that and the hat. Right. Well, but, uh, it sounds like an I'm enjoyable just gonna buy class. A hat. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably easier. Yeah. Sensitivity but, training. Yeah. Oh, McCoy, you're everyone. You're you're like the Lisa Simpson of uh, Star Trek. You just really are. <laughs> great actor, though. He is a great actor. You know, back in the day before Star Trek, he was head of the Hollywood Badmans Association. I know he was in the Light Night of the Lepus. He was one of these guys <laughs> was, that or not, could wait. only get work as a villain before I can Star see that. Trek. Because, and he was a psycho man. Like remember him in the. In Showdown at the OK Corral, he played Doc Holliday. Yeah, I've not seen Showdown. Yeah, and they only let him do it one time in Star Trek, and it was during uh, City on the Edge of Forever, where he was really allowed to cut loose. Mm -hmm. But, boy, like, I saw him in an episode of Bonanza where he played this crazy army captain. He's like, no, 
kill all the Indians. And this guy, and went, boy, he is. Yeah. He cuts loose, but he always played black hats, uh, Confederate officers. It's funny because like you that. think stuff like Leslie Nielsen always played like the tough leading man yeah. Yeah. handsome he is a very leading man yeah. and handsome and then when he parodied that one time he did it so well that he got stuck in that forever yeah ride. yeah well he'd already had a lengthy career before he started doing the parodies right Fair people, people so don't like, remember him you know that was kind of that was basically the, the last movie the last I saw him in that was career. series was um day of the animals where he was like the did, jerk and he tried to fight a bear with his shirt off did you know forbidden <laughs> planet lost money I did not know that, but that's Forbidden not surprising. Planet lost money, and it wasn't because it was cutting edge. It was ahead of its time, but it arrived just it's as a the beautiful movie. Yeah, as the drive-in movie was becoming huge, Forbidden Planet just didn't fit the bill, and that it lost. Money. It was a little too uh, cerebral. Yeah, it lost money. Make me think right here while I'm seeing the back of this. I read in in movie memories that him and Ricardo Montalban didn't like the fact that there wasn't a fight scene. Who, uh, Shatner, you mean? Yeah, between the two of them, because they wanted another fight scene like they had in the show. So they went into Harv Bennett's office and had this, like, amoke time <laughs> fight scene with the da 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 and then and, and the lamps, and they threw, and, and he bounced off and threw him off the couch, and he, ah, and went, and, and Harv Bennett just you know, didn't even look up. Just, <laughs> get out. Which, and which threw them both out of this. Which, <laughs> which <Yeah>. by... <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, um, speaking of uh, Amok Time and that fight between Kirk and Spock, um, my absolute favorite uh, sort of parody, or I guess play on that, is uh, Jim Carrey and Cable Guy mm-hmm. uh, when they That's do the uh, when they so. do when they do medieval when they do the medieval, medieval times, times medieval times. Um, the thing is, though, it's not the same without the music. Do you have any volume or no? I do, but we're not at that particular scene. This look for some reason I seem to have pulled up a Spanish subtitled version of. Uh, That's of right. The film. I just so, lost um, Outlaw of Gore in uh, Finnish well, because I couldn't find a see, copy of it. Shatner and Montalban had this great idea. He said, "You've got the Genesis planet. It says we're going to have a fight with whips made from scorpion tails and stuff because we can do that. We can make anything out of this Genesis stuff." Well, if we're going to see it, let's it let's see the original here. How about uh, pop up a little volume there? And uh... Uh. I can't remember the name of the actress that played T'Pau here, but she was a dame. She was a uh, she actually had a British title, and she couldn't do this. She would her hand is under the camera. She had to, like, didn't she glue her fingers together? She, no, she but she's like, and then she'd go spook. Good and put her hand up. She had to do it underneath the camera to make it, and then hold her hand. <laughs> I up. can see how some people would have a trouble with that. I, yeah, I, I, right. I and, and so that there, that is a, the classic. That that everybody loves, which they, is. They uh, broke things. I could just see him sitting there like they. <sighs> yeah, they broke things, and then he said, "Get out." There's not going to be any fight scene between Kirk and and Khan. Get out. The thing is, the movie's almost more interesting <laughs> right, than there isn't. Right, 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 right. But, so. So then here is basically a uh, the Cable Guy version of... Cable Guy is such a great film. That's Jim Carrey, probably still to this day, Jim Carrey's best movie. Those are Lurpas. It looks like they've actually got the Lurpas. The name is Spock. If we don't battle to the death, they will kill us both. This is Star Trek. So, yeah, we don't need to watch this whole scene. My, Seriously, uh, see, see the Cable Guy if you haven't seen it. A lot of people seen, didn't you, like it. If you've not seen oh Cable Guy, it I is, went into that movie hating, hating Jim Harry, hated him, and I think I was with. They made it to look like a lurp. That's so funny. It's such a smart movie. It's really, really, really it, it good. Was, it is still to, to this day my absolute favorite, and I think Jim Carrey's best 
film, and, yeah. and just uh, still, Fantastic. just a funny, funny comedy. Have you have you seen Cable Guy before? No. Super, no. You have really? Now that you've seen that scene, you know you have to see it's the rest funny of the but movie. Horrifying too, like there's yeah. parts that move it's like it's dark, really deranged. It's creepy. Wow. It's yeah. good though. Yeah, it's really the it's scene really where good. he finally tells him to get lost in the rain is. It's legit. That's a that's a scene from a creepy thriller. I mean, yeah. it's creepy, wow. but it's yeah. good. It's funny as hell. It's it's super funny. You know, you've got bits like that where when it's funny. Guys cut loose. They cut loose. Yeah. Like the best serial killers in the show Criminal Minds are always played by people like Luke Perry, Jason Alexander, who uh, played light stuff. Right. Because yeah. I saw they Luke want Perry the chance to cut loose. I saw Luke Perry in a movie of all crazy things that was, I went on a big Bermuda Triangle movie kick. Mm-hmm. And um, only someone, one of us, would do something like this. <laughs> and um, I was watching a movie where Luke Perry and his friends get lost in the Bermuda Triangle, and they find a ship, and they're on the ship. And Luke Perry goes insane, shining style, and and he's amazing. Jack Nicholson, crazy, insane, flipping out. I'm watching. It, I'm like, wow, he is an incredible actor. The this, difference being that Jack Nicholson is a hack and just plays the same character in everything. Well, he's always Jack Nicholson. About Luke Perry, <laughs> but Luke Perry was. Yeah. But Luke yeah. Perry was. Really good in it. I'm sure. That's right, like, folks. You heard it right here. Uh, we just said that Luke Perry is a better actor than Jack Nicholson. I'm, I'm down with that. I'd rather have a beer with Luke Perry, I'll tell you right now. Yeah. Okay. Only If only because I once read a magazine article where he claimed he was thrown out of his first high school because one of his friends was in detention and he wanted to get him out so they could go to the beach. So he barged in there with a ski mask and a prop grenade that he stole from his dad <laughs> or a friend of his family or something. So like, I'm going to blow, blah, 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 and busted his friend out of detention and got arrested six hours later. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, that's good stuff. But that aside, in this trashy, dumb, weird Bermuda Triangle gimmick slasher movie, he was just put on this incredible performance. He's just like chewed up the scenery in a good way. He was scary. as fun. It was, it was good. He, he was great. He played David Koresh. Like uh, a David Koresh type hmm. character in this one I'm talking about. Cool. He was quoting Bible verses and running around with an AK and everything. And he he's one of, he's one of those odd actors like you wouldn't think, given my pretensions, that I would like. Mm -hmm. But he and um, I can never remember the actor's name, but the kid, Mark Gossidner, whatever. He was Zach in Zach in Saved by the Bell. Yeah. Yes. Anything yes. I see him, he's really good. Yeah. He's a great actor and he's, he's charismatic and likable and everything. Well, the, the problem is they get stuck in these, you know, like, Teen roles, and then everybody, oh, the teen, oh, yeah, that guy Zach, oh. and they don't realize that these guys have spent their entire lives acting People and don't you know performing. That you know, a, they they I I've always had a trouble understanding typecasting because, like for instance, Fred Gwynn didn't work for years. They matter of fact, they just had Fred Gwynn in South Park last week again. They yeah, they played the. Oh, the I missed man. last week, so I haven't seen they last week. They had the old man from Pet Cemetery. In there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I haven't watched that one yet. But he didn't work for years after he played Herman Munster. Yeah. And the reason was because he was Herman Munster. And the funny thing is, I like, I don't know, I think more people like Hollywood and TV studios think that people don't like that. I like seeing, like, I would love, like, I like, I would like seeing Adam West right after Batman do something completely the opposite. Right. I Adam, love seeing that because it just blows me away. Adam especially West when it's good. didn't do anything for like a decade yeah. after Batman except yeah. get shot out of cannons and show up at car shows. Yeah, I think <laughs> the first thing I saw him in after that was Zombie Nightmare with John McKeel Thor was the yeah. other <laughs> star yeah. of that movie. He had good contracts so he never had to work again right. after Batman. But you know, but, the thing is if you act, you want to work. Yeah. You just enjoy it. You yeah, want to do it. You're bored. He, oh, he yeah. was pissed. Yeah. He was pissed. He went on. He went through. A and when they put, they put him like in that seventies superheroes, there were two. I remember seeing him on Love that. American Style. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Love American Style. He was in Love American Style. That that's like a, one appearance. It's like Love American Style. Love American Style kicked ass. I never saw it. <laughs> oh, it's a great show. It's real funny. <laughs> but, uh, it's like Brian Cranston. You were mentioning him earlier from Argo. Uh, his big move show on TV right now is Breaking Bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. They did not want to cast him, despite the fact that the part was written for him. Because of his Malcolm. Stereo, Malcolm in the Middle, How? they wanted Matthew Broderick actually. Really? Because they, they which is odd. No. How is he not typecast? Movies for so long at that point, though, mm -hmm. that they said they could like, sort of like re reinvent him, yeah. sort of thing. But Brian Cranston's like everyone that grew up with Malcolm in the Middle is not going to watch this show because it's a different kind of show. Total show, yeah. Different and the different thing is, show. I didn't even recognize him. So Anne Rice threw a fit that Tom Cruise was going to play. Uh, Lestat. Yeah, in the interview with the vampire. Yeah, and he pulled it off very nicely, though. Yeah. I, I've know? never seen that interview, strangely enough. I'm yeah. not a big vampire yeah, in, fan. In New Orleans, uh, back when I used to go to New Orleans on business, like, all the time, um, 
Anne Rice actually was not liked very well. Everybody basically right. kind of thought of her as like a bitch around town sort of thing because she 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 always so she thought she was queen of New Orleans. She, she thought she was queen of New Orleans, and yeah. if they were like there was this uh, this restaurant, this one particular restaurant I used to like to go to all the time uh, when I would go there, and I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, but Anne Rice literally wrote these editorials that would show up in the newspaper, like slamming this restaurant and how horrible it was because it wasn't authentic, true New Orleans style because it was in a new building. And it, went, it was like all these different things. And I think the name of the restaurant was like Straya or something like that, but the food was phenomenal, which anywhere in New Orleans you can go, the food is awesome. But they would actually frame these like bad articles and notes that she would write to the restaurant, like criticizing them and they would frame them and put them on the walls so that when you would come in, you'd see like these horribly critical articles and things on the walls from Anne rice like ripping this particular restaurant because from a woman who like couldn't write her way out of a paper bag yeah. Yeah. so it was uh, a little uh, little entertaining there so uh, so Brad actually is uh, is working on a, a book right now about fantasy sword and sorcery uh, films yes. uh, cool. working working title right now is trash of the Titans best I, can. <laughs> I like it that That's makes good. me happy because I, I, like I wasn't sure about it but uh, so I spent the uh, whole last uh, month watching uh, things like <clears throat> uh, the Beastmaster and the sequel is Deathstalker, Crawl. Your cover um, might be Vampira. I actually the ghoul from from that one with Gary Lockwood. That's copywritten, but it I is. actually have I actually purchased a cover, and it's just a very pretty young lady um, dressed as a barbarian slave. Oh. It, it looks it looks good. I had no idea that was Vampira in that movie, and I love that movie. Which movie is this now? Yeah, is it Speaking the of Beastmaster, the Sorcerer. Oh, with Gary Lockwood. Yeah, saw is the sword and the sorcerer. Be- with the sword and they have that and it shoots the yeah and Basil Just Rathbone watched that last night. plays the wizard and Gary Lockwood is the good guy but I didn't know it was Vampira as the beautiful girl that turns into the monster and tries to kill the French knight okay I that's actually her. I have not seen that one that's but I, so it's like Mystery all Science fantasy Theater so. did it too believe okay. it or not which I couldn't understand because it's such a good movie I, I love these fantasy yeah. films they're fun happened to the guy that played Beastmaster like he was in every like Mark, he did Mark everything yeah. Mark he Singer. made Beastmaster 3 in the 90s he was in V Mark he Singer he's a yeah. big boy yeah. man yeah. yeah Mark Singer yeah. he was in a, the last thing I remember seeing him in was an episode of Highlander the TV show yeah, he's done yeah, he's I, done I actually just just to pat I won't say to pat it because that doesn't sound right but just to uh, have some more material in it, because there aren't enough of these movies really for a book initially. You'd think. I actually found it out, but I put the Highlander movies in there as well. So, yeah. Except yeah. I didn't review the first one because I, I kind of tend to concentrate on movies that fail. That, that uh, Ryan Reynolds is the new Highlander? What? I'm not making it up. They oh, Highlander really? was beat yeah. to death. Oh, uh, they did beat the hell out of that. I, thank you. May let I toast you for go. that? Yes, it was fun, but let it go. I remember when the I stopped that, watching the show. I never even saw the show. They had Randall Tex Cobb in there, who I loved as an actor. I think he's I like dead that. now. Uh, yeah, I think he, he is. played the nomad biker in uh, Raising Arizona, and he played Sailor in Uncommon Valor. When he was a boxer, he could not be knocked down. Larry Holmes couldn't knock yeah. him down. And then he left the arena, and a car hit him, and the car couldn't knock him down. <laughs> he broke the car. Yeah. And. Uh, Anyway, they, he played an immortal who uh, was a Civil War vet or something like that, and he had killed Duncan's family when Duncan was an Indian or something. Right. And so Duncan's fighting him with a spear, and Randall Tex Cobb has like a cavalry sword. And uh, he, I said, if he beheads him with that spear, and just as he, he, <laughs> he spun around and took his head off, I said, I will never watch this show again. <laughs> And I've I never shut it off and I never I'll watched tell you what, it again. I always thought the original movie was really overrated. It's not that great. It's fun. It's well shot. It's mm-hmm. well directed, but it's kind of boring and epic and over and overindulgent and annoying. And I thought it was very average. I would give it like on a scale of one to four. I give it like a two, maybe two and a half. But then watching the sequels is just like, oh what my god. What happened in number god. two? Did they go to the future? Oh, that was so? fun. Yeah. I didn't like number oh, the planet oh Zeist. So fucking weird. And Michael was, Ironside's yeah. got I, when, one that is included and that is included in my book. <laughs> that is included in my book. <laughs> but I reviewed awesome. the I reviewed the renegade version where they re edited yeah, yeah. it. It was Dune, minutes. they just put Dune in there. It just That's said, funny. They really did. We're really from the planet Dune. And we said, yeah, that would And then they're cool. like, oh shit, we can't do that. So they like put Zeist over Zeist. Dune. Yeah. It all right, so cool. they made it cool. But and these I'm gonna talk about movies called movies that made movies cool. 
<laughs> I'm, uh, speaking of being a Mark Singer real quick, you guys were wondering uh, Mar about Mark Singer, and I'm going to run, uh, here's a, the trailer for the original V. The uh, original V was fantastic. Mark, Mark, Sing Mark Singer is... And this is not the trailer for it. Is working, still working, yeah, and has... Been, a remake. This and is has, not the trailer for the original Oh, okay, movie. sorry. But has been working steadily, like, doing one thing, like, every single year. There was a Beastmaster TV series in 1999 that apparently he was in as well. I didn't know he was in the um, series. But they he's, had he's done everything. Scene in the original V, where they have a fight with like laser swords or something, just so they could put a sword in Mark Singer's hands. Um, he was the sort of the hero character, wasn't he? Yeah. It'd be, oh yeah. He yeah. was the primary hero. Yeah. He was the. Him and him John. V Adams. was great. The first yeah. V miniseries and yeah. the Mars and Chronicles are my two favorite sci-fi miniseries ever. You saw that I found. Uh, I was in a photo shoot in uh, yeah, San Diego guy. last year, and the studio they took us to for the photo shoot. One of the original prop Sky Fighters from V. Was oh, that's cool. Sitting, oh, yeah, you, t you said that. Just sitting there on a stereo speaker in the studio, and I just turned it around with my hand, and it was missing one of the guns. It looked like it was made out of balsa wood. It's on my YouTube channel if anybody wants to see it. I think it. you showed us that. Yeah, yeah, go to LST1195 or just type in uh, prop Sky Fighter from V, and you'll get to see one of the original Sky Fighters from V. All right, so I got to hype my, my upcoming book real quick, though. What everybody's favorite fantasy 80s big fan, sword and sorcery when that was big for a while. Uh, um, and I'm going to throw favorite. mine out real quick because I, you know, I, either way. My favorite that I think is good and a great, I mean, a great film and underrated is Dragon Slayer. I think Dragon Slayer I is enjoyed Dragon Slayer. phenomenal. Do you know, even though he's got curly hair and you don't recognize him, that's the same guy that played young Clark Kent in the first Superman movie? He was also in Alan McBeal. He was the quirky... There's your 1983 V yeah. right there. He was yeah. the quirky um, attorney in Alan McBeal. Yeah. But he also played a... V, no, that might even be the Christian. one... One of these might even be the one I was Oh, he was the bad guy who goes to I forgot that's about cool. that. Yeah, because it was just sitting there. He's much better in Dragon Slayer. Yeah, you know, I... There's so many of those I can't remember. You know, for some reason, when I was a kid, I, there was one that was on TV that I, I can't remember the name of. What? Uh, on I, what? Like one of those fantasy movies, and I remember. Uh, I know exactly what it you was. You know what I'm talking about? Exactly. There was there like these uh, like lizard the kind of. The Archer and the uh, the Archer. Archer the, fugitive from the Empire. Archer fugitive from the Empire. I have that on VHS. Vaguely you know, remember. You know, as a kid, I don't remember how old it I has, was. Um, what is his name? Let's see if I can oh, find the it. Your little heavy set, white haired. Oh, what is now, that? See, in the eighties. The, the guy from Bonanza. Uh, Lauren Green. Lauren Green. Not Lauren. No, maybe I think they were, Michael Landon. No, maybe it's not Bonanza. Pernell Roberts. Um, white hair, a little heavy set. He was. Uh, he used to do a lot of documentaries. He had a really good voice, very gravelly. Um, oh, what is that? Gravelly guy? white haired wow. guy that did I'm documentaries. I, I no, no, he he was in one of those. David Canary. It may not have been Bonanza. It was one of those shows. One of the western, big western shows. that was on for. It wasn't Gunsmoke. It wasn't James Arnest or anything like. That. Oh, what is that guy's name? It's gonna drive me crazy now. He was in. Um, he, but he played the the chief in uh, that fantasy movie you're trying to remember. Right. And I, oh, you have to look it up. I don't know if this is... See, I didn't really... Archer, Fugitive of the Empire, look it up. In the 80s, yeah, I, I was all it. about Airwolf and Blue Thunder and, I liked and Airwolf. stuff like that. I never I, saw Airwolf. I've never to this day hasn't oh, seen an episode of Airwolf. Oh, I love Airwolf. Airwolf. Or was... the short-lived Blue Thunder series either. I have every didn't, episode didn't on DVD. Blue Thunder? Wasn't he like a total alcoholic, drug, crazy... Jan Michael Jan Vincent. Jan Michael Vincent. Yeah. 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 He, he was, a, lunatic. He was a, a brawling, drunken lunatic. His his nickname he, was One Punch Vincent. He was the look last. Up, look up. Um, he was the last of the of the guys. It's called that Archer, fugitive really from the it. Empire. It wasn't yeah. coming up. He was the last what? of the guys. Like yeah. nowadays, they say on IMDb. Oh well, because of insurance, no, you can't do your I was own to fight scenes. Oh no, no, I don't, I'm just saying, trying to figure out who the name of the. If yeah. I remember correctly, yeah. it may not be true, but it's like an urban legend. Him, uh, David Carradine, and Robert Conrad would walk into a bar together. They'd order a shot. They'd do it, and whoever finished it first and got the, uh, the the shot glass back on the table was required to yell, go, and turn around and throw the first punch and just get whoever <laughs> was standing behind them. And the three of them would clean out the bar everywhere they went. Jan got into a fight one time. Somebody was talking smack about his wife, and he walked into a bar four guys like you hear the thing well why don't they attack the karate guy all at once and kick his ass wouldn't have worked with Jan Jan walked in grabbed the first one boom second one got up boom put him in a coma with one punch third guy boom by the fourth guy the fourth guy's up against the bar I don't want any I don't want any and that was the end of the fight and uh 
but he had to go to court over that and everything. But when they realized it was four on one, he didn't, you know, serve yeah. any time or anything like that. But uh, yeah, he was. But yeah, Jan See, Jan hard, Michael Vincent. No, he's around. Hard Jan drinker, hard fighter. He escaped. He worked on this movie called Redline with Dom DeLuise, and it's so much fun. It goes to show, even with all the trouble he had, what a phenomenal actor he was. He got into a wreck in a Jeep Grand Cherokee. It rolled down the side of a mountain in California. They took him to the hospital. He was due on the set of this movie called Redline. They stitched his face all shut and everything. He escaped from the hospital in a gown showed up on the set of Redline. They put him in, in the wardrobe for Redline, so he, he was a, he still has the hospital bracelet on his <laughs> wrist. But they're like, God, his face is all stitched shut. So what they do this scene, it's all about car thieving or, or car chopping or something like that. And they're doing this scene where they're beating up one of the, the good guys, and Jan says, I don't appreciate having my face all torn up like Frankenstein because we work in this business. And, blah, blah. and, and Dom DeLuise rolls with him and goes, No, no, calm down, Frankenstein. Calm down and everything. And they played his stitches right into right. the movie. And it was uh, Chap. I can't remember the producer. Oh. How much time is left on that camera, Brad? Oh, um, as I walk in front, as you walk in front of it. Chap. Um, but the producer of the film says, oh, I'll always work with Jan Michael Vincent after that. What's it's it up just, to? He pulled it off it so well. And even improvised his stitches and everything into the into the movie oh, and everything and, and he said he would always work with Jan Michael Vincent after that and yeah I got, yeah. I got his autograph on my wall at home he sent me an autograph picture yeah Jan Michael Vincent a lot of people may not remember back in the day he was when he when he first started out as like a young eighteen year old actor. He was like this. The man. He was like he pretty. Was the Brad he was really Pitt. pretty. You know. He was yeah. The he was Brad, Brad Pitt of his day. He was the Brad Pitt of the seventies, basically. But that's also why he was such a brawler too, yeah. is because other guys didn't like the fact that he was. They always thought he was like a pretty boy. Yeah. And uh, so he ended up having to defend take him. his they prettiness, they basically. Take him. And they made wrong. The yeah. <laughs> and and he did. He was a raging alcoholic for a long time. Yeah. I, I don't know if he still is. A lot of got in a lot of trouble with the law. Mm -hmm. Well, and, the thing is, you never. That's why you don't be. You don't be the guy who walks around getting into fights for no reason. Yeah. That's one thing. If someone starts something with you, but you just don't start fights. I had a buddy. You just don't know who you're getting well, a fight with. The thing is, I had a buddy who's in the in the um, excuse me in the Air Force, and he was telling me a story when I was visiting him in Virginia, where he. Uh, was in Vegas just on leave, having a good time. You bumped into a Marine. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, military. So they're hanging out, drinking. The Marine guy was probably superhero size, big guy. And um, this hippie was sitting there drinking a beer, and uh, the Marine starts giving the hippie trouble. And my buddy's like, yeah, you know, leave him. Who cares? A hippie, whatever. F him. You know, it's not, it's not a business. Marine won't let it go, won't let it go, won't let it go. They get in a fight right there in the middle of the place. Hippie kicks his ass. I mean, drops the motherfucker. And he's like, I told you, just like, let it go. You just don't know. Don't start Maybe the fight. Could have been Jan Michael Vincent. Yeah, yeah you, you don't just know. don't. You just yeah, don't. Yeah. Know. Maybe he couldn't afford a haircut that week. You know, yeah. <laughs> leave the guy alone. You know, it's funny to don't me be too, that guy. In the '80s, he was the highest paid actor on television. On television, yeah. two hundred and fifty thousand dollars an episode for Airwolf. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, you couldn't get one of these guys on Friends or something like that to get out of bed for that kind of yeah. money. Yeah. And Jan did it all. I mean, he did his own stunts. He did his own fighting. He. He did a little bit of his own flying. Oh yeah! Believe it or not, he had stick time in the two twenty-two. Really? Him and uh, Ernest Borgnine would flip a coin to see who was going to fly the bird out to the Mojave, hmm. so they could start filming and that kind of thing. You That's know, I, awesome. just, I just, I know everyone is. Why do you like Jan Michael Vincent? I just idolize the guy. I work with him in a heartbeat. I, I was, yeah. I was, uh, Hooper. I was. He's in Hooper. He yeah. plays the young. Schnitzky was his name. Yeah, the stunt man with the jet powered transit. Yeah, I was. Okay, I was talking. I'm, I'm, man, man, for one second. The actor I couldn't think of who plays the king in that obscure fantasy right. pilot is uh, George Kennedy. Oh, okay, George Kennedy. Oh, I love George Kennedy. Kennedy. Yeah, I, I was talking yeah, I to. I, he wasn't. What in a, Western was he? He wasn't. I was misthinking. So that's yeah, why I'm confusing every. Guy. I was confusing everyone. George I was, Kennedy. Superhero. I may have told you the story before, but I was. Uh, I was working on a film with uh, Jeff McKay. And uh, oh, for, I the, love Jeff for those of you who may or not may not remember, I Jeff, gave I'm, I'll be on my phone. Monkey yes. book for him to sign yes. for you. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff McKay what is a great an, show. was an actor who who was uh, Robert Redford's cousin, and Robert Redford got him his start by giving him a small role in All the President's Men. 
Wow. And uh, so Jeff McKay did uh, did a lot of TV back in the day. He did um, Baba Ba Black Sheep. Mm -hmm. or Black don't Sheep's, forget, Black he, uh, Sheep's most Squadron. people will probably know him from Magnum He was he was Mac in Magnum PI. He worked for Belisarius yes. a lot. Yeah. He did, he did Belisarius a lot. Is fantastic. He did a lot of stuff for Belisarius. But he, I was uh, I was on set with him, and he was uh, in the film. I played his son uh, in in the film, and so we did a lot of we had a lot of screen time together, a lot of time you know like kind of off camera and stuff. And I hung out with him. He was a really cool guy. He unfortunately died very young because he had liver problems. Um, from drinking too much, and he was actually also in Tales of the Gold Monkey. He played Corky in Tales of the Gold Monkey. Another great. For show. those of you who don't remember, find it on Netflix. It's awesome. It's really, really cool. It's basically. Stephen Collins. It is. A, yeah. Yep. With uh, Stephen Collins in it, and it is um, it takes place in the 1930s in the South Pacific. This guy that just runs a uh, a little charter plane, a little uh, Grum you know Grum and Goose. But uh, so it was and the thing is at that I remember at that time because that was when TV was still just very clean and and my mom literally watched that she's like i've never watched this show okay so anymore. uh Jeff so okay gold monkey so we, we ran a ran out of uh didn't, technically it's not tape but ran out of uh memory digital space uh but i what i was saying about jeff mckay who jeff mckay was also in tales of gold monkey and tales of gold monkey was a really cool show find it on netflix you can watch the entire series on netflix uh, TV show from the early It's 1980s. available on DVD now, right? Yeah, so, it's on DVD, so okay. that so you can get all the DVDs from Netflix. And you know they they wanted to do this sort of uh, Indiana Jones style thing because Indiana Jones was very popular. Right. Well, the show was actually pitched long before but that, but it was pitched before that. So, um, but Belisarius, who uh, Donald Belisarius, who um, created these shows that Jeff McKay was on, I was on, I was on set with Jeff McKay, and we were talking and we were talking about these films and that sort of stuff and uh, and the TV shows. And he says, uh, well, "You remember Airwolf, right?" And I was like, "Yeah, of course, I loved Airwolf as a kid." And he said, "Well." You know why Airwolf got started is because uh, Belisario wanted to buy a helicopter, but he didn't want to pay for it himself. <laughs> <laughs> so he decided that he would create a TV show with a really cool helicopter in it so that he could buy and own his own helicopter. That's so, awesome. So Don, Donald Belisario created Airwolf strictly so that he could buy a helicopter for the, uh, for the TV wow. show. I always so assumed he, it was just a rip off of Blue Thunder. So, so he me too. Have his own me too. Well, it, it played well on that, but uh, so Jeff McKay told me because he was good friends with uh, uh, Donald Belisario. And another funny story then, I was on set with Jeff McKay once. We we're talking about Magnum P.I. and everybody remembers uh, John Hillerman who played mm -hmm. um, Higgins, Higgins and Magnum P.I. And him and Jeff were really good buddies. And he's like, you want to talk to him? I'll call him right now. He pulls out his cell phone and he calls up John Hillerman in Texas. And That's he awesome. He's on speakerphone <laughs> and we sat there having a, a conversation with John, John Hillerman who... In the TV show in Magnum PI, you know he played this proper. Wasn't uh, he from Texas or something? Proper, yeah. Bri proper British he man. Fooled people. But he but then when people. you when you, he he actually had a little bit of a, a Southern Texas drawl in what real he sounded life. like in Blazing Saddles is what he really sounds yeah. like. Yeah. So it, 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 fantastic. So you heard the so you heard the Magnum voice. Magnum nuts. Here I am telling the whole story without my microphone. I, it's okay. No, I, we, we can hear you. But I'm sure yeah. we, I'm sure we picked it up. But so you heard uh, Hillerman's voice, uh, and it was like. That's Higgins from Magnum PI, but it's, that's not a British accent. It's like this Texas, and so it was weird. But but Jeff McKay was a really uh, a really cool guy, a really good guy, and yeah. uh, he died at sixty, way before uh, yeah, you know, way way too young. But one of the things that he would he told me too is on um, Tales of the Gold Monkey, you know, part of the Gold Monkey was this bar that was run by um, what's his name. Um, Roddy, McDowell. Roddy McDowell, who also, you know, I plan, forgot plan, Roddy plan McDowell's even in so Roddy show. McDowell's in that show. Hey, do you have the DVDs, by the way? I don't. I got, I got them on Netflix and, okay. and watched it all. But um, I got a hold of thought for when you're done. But they, uh, but they would, <coughs> the, in this bar, they actually had real beer in all the kegs that they had at the bar. So they were constantly drinking on set because there was always oh. there were always scenes and shots of them like drinking mugs of beer, and so they always had like. And, he, take. <laughs> and they, they filmed they filmed this in Hawaii and uh, and Jeff said that the uh, the season that he worked on on that show with Stephen Collins and with Roddy McDowell and everything was the best and most fun he has ever had working in the business his entire life was doing that one season of Tales of the Gold Monkey That's which awesome. something like twenty four episodes. Yeah, it, it's episode funny like I mean that show's not I mean that show's finally remembered by people who saw saw it but yeah. it, it didn't do well in the ratings I think it was against another show that was yeah. really big Dynasty or some stupid crap that nobody cares about anymore. And um, but it's funny how these shows and these movies that people don't really think about are the ones that people walk away from and say I had the best time working on that. Right. Like um, I cannot remember her name, but one of the um, women in um, who's won like an Oscar and just like highly regarded just in the business in general said the best thing she ever worked on was Grandma's Boy. She said <laughs> that's the most fun I've ever had working on a film. You just made me think too the the being the pseudomation guy, the Godzilla and everything. It just popped into my head how awesome. The baboon suits were in Tales of the Gold Monkey. Yeah, like where they run into the baboons. Yeah. And in the pilot, like, yeah, the Nazis. Nice monkey, and he's like, 
right. And you just and it, I wonder who did those. I didn't even you see at the time you don't even yeah. think that was a suit. It just dawned on mm-hmm. me just now that was a suit. Man, those were good. Rick Baker yeah. used to do those. It might have been him. Maybe. Yeah, Maybe. it was good. So we've uh, we've ran over time. I wanted to run it a little shorter today because I'm leaving to go to the happened. leaving to go to the Bucks game. But we know uh, we know that that never happened. That never but happened. regardless, uh, we got sensitivity trained. We had said we hope we hope that you uh, that you all enjoyed uh, listening to us ramble like usual. Uh, join us again next week for episode. 14 uh, for when everyone are we gonna, What here. is next week? Are we going to do a Halloween episode in two weeks probably? Right? Um, Makes sense. Well, you know, I am going to L.A. on business coming up here. We'll figure it out. But we'll, we'll okay. do a Halloween episode soon. We should, even if we have to do it like The Simpsons is the week after Halloween. We could, cool. we'll, we'll get it figured out. We could, and we could always record on a, on a, not a Sunday and do True. it, find another time to do it. And then, you know, so anyways, there will be a Halloween episode coming up soon, 14 or 15, episode 14 or 15. Cool. Here we'll do it. So, uh, I guess, uh, we're working on our first full season here. We get to 22 episodes. We'll have a full season, full hour long <laughs> season in, uh, <laughs> ourselves. It'd be funny so. if somebody bought it. Yeah. Uh, so thanks again, everybody for it's joining us. Variant, maybe. We, uh, mm-hmm. hope you enjoyed it as much as we did and, uh, we'll see you next week.